This is my contribution to the Summer of Math exposition. I want to highlight one of the most extraordinary principles of physics, the principle of least action. Although it unleashes its full power in the realm of field theories, the basic idea can easily be understood in the framework of simple mechanical systems. The problem to start with is very simple. Given a sheet of paper, what is the largest box that can be constructed out of it? The method from calculus to solve this problem is reviewed and then by analogy the method is carried over to physics and applied to three different systems. The free fall, the pendulum and the double pendulum. Sometimes only ideas and concepts are presented and the details are outsourced to an accompanying video. So let's get started. A sheet of paper 33 cm long is used to build a box. For this at each corner a square piece is removed and the remaining side pieces are just folded up. What is the largest volume that can be achieved? Let's run through a few examples. When the removed parts are 6 cm long, the final box has a length and width of 21 cm and a height of 6 cm, which yields a volume of 2.6 liters. Of course, if you don't like centimeters, no big deal, you can simply replace them by inches. Your sheet of paper will be larger, but the numbers will stay the same. For two more different corner pieces, the volume is calculated and the values are shown in the diagram. From these examples, it seems that the largest box can be obtained for about 6 cm. The precise value can be worked out with calculus. To do so, the volume of the box has to be expressed for arbitrary corner pieces of size x. The value x determines the height of the box and it has to be removed twice from 33 to get the length of the bottom square. The graph of this function is also shown in the plot. The first derivative of the function is a measure for the slope of the tangent at each point of the graph. At the optimal position the slope of the tangent is zero. The point can be calculated from the condition that the first derivative has to vanish. There are two solutions, one corresponds to the largest and one to the smallest volume. With this tool at hand, let's have a look at a simple problem from physics. Consider the free fall of an object that is dropped from a height of 5 meters. It will fall for about one second before it touches the ground. A closer look shows the height of the object for intermediate steps in time. The fall is represented by a graph that is mathematically described by a parabola with its vertex at 0, 5 and a 0 at t equals 1. Now imagine that this parabola is just one out of an infinite set of smooth functions that interpolate between the initial and the final state of this motion. You may think of them to be alternative trajectories in different universes with different physical laws. And imagine further that there is an operator that converts each of these functions into a number. All the functions shown here belong to one family of curves that are all mapped onto the red graph. And indeed, the value that corresponds to the physical solution of our world matches with the value that has a tangent line with zero slope. Isn't this amazing? And how does the operator look like? Physicists name this operator action and denote it with a capital S. For this example it takes the following form. It is an integral from the time of the initial state to the time of the final state and it integrates the height function and the square of its first derivative the velocity, so to speak. In the language of physics, the two terms correspond to the kinetic and the potential energy of the falling object, and the difference of the two energies is usually called the Lagrangian of the system. Moreover, in physics, time derivatives are denoted with a dot instead of primes. And this is a good time for a short summary. In calculus, you can find maxima or minima of functions simply by checking all zeros of the first derivative, which corresponds to finding all points where the tangent has zero slope. Finally, in physics, the zero of the variational derivative of the action automatically leads to a physical law in disguise of a differential equation, whose solution describes the change of a physical system over time. In other words, among the set of all imaginable trajectories between the initial and the final state, the requirement of an optimal value for the action automatically picks the motion that is realized in nature. This idea is realized in almost all areas of physics and very universal. 
Now we are ready to apply this concept to another simple physical system. A mass suspended to a light stick that can rotate around a pivot point. The kinetic energy of the mass depends on the rate of change of the angle of rotation. The potential energy depends on the height where the mass is lifted up to. This height h can be expressed by the difference between the length of the stick and the purple side of this right triangle. The two expressions form the Lagrangian and the action for the system. How can the variational derivative be calculated? There are three steps to get from the action to the equation of motion. Here we only state the generic recipe, the details can be found in the second video. The equation of motion consists of two terms. For the first term, simply treat the Lagrangian as a function of the angle phi only and take the first derivative with respect to phi. For the second term, you first treat the Lagrangian as a function of phi dot and take the derivative with respect to phi dot. Then you remember that phi and phi dot are functions of time and you take the time derivative of the second term. This differential equation captures all the dynamical features that you can expect for such a pendulum. For small displacements, you will recover a harmonic oscillation back and forth around the equilibrium position. However, for a pendulum that is displaced almost to its top position, one expects that it stays much longer in this position. This is exactly shown in the simulation, which solely depends on this yellow equation of motion. The details of such a simulation from a differential equation are presented as bonus material in the second video. So far, the examples had been simple and could have easily been worked out without the principle of least action. For the next example, however, this principle is a very elegant approach to obtain the dynamics of the system. Instead of a single pendulum, now two of them are linked to one another in such a way that the dynamics of the second one is not only caused by gravity, but it is also driven by the motion of the first one and vice versa. To keep things simple, the length and the masses of the two are identical. The potential energy for the first pendulum is the same as before. The second pendulum, however, is lifted due to its own displacement and due to the displacement of the first pendulum. Therefore, there are two contributions to its potential energy. The kinetic energy for the first one is the same as before. The second pendulum has a similar term. However, its velocity also depends on the motion of the first pendulum. The precise back reaction between the first and the second pendulum seems difficult to understand. However, the mutual interaction on the level of the action is captured by a simple looking elegant interaction term. The full derivation of this kinetic energy and the resulting equations of motion are postponed to the second video. Here instead we just enjoy the incredible richness of the dynamics that is introduced by the simple interaction term. The simulation is run a second time with a slight change in the initial conditions of the second pendulum. This causes completely different dynamics in the long run. Therefore the motion of this double pendulum is more or less unpredictable, since the initial conditions are never known perfectly. And therefore no simulation is able to track the motion of a real double pendulum for a long time. The system is called chaotic. This is a very generic phenomenon and it is for instance the reason why weather forecasts are less accurate the longer they are extrapolated into the future. Nonetheless, by constructing each of these functions optimize the action of the system for their initial and final states. The presented examples will be a good starting point if you want to make yourself familiar with the concept of the least action principle. However, its most important applications arise in field theories. Most of the established physical theories can be derived from actions as for instance electrodynamics or general relativity. And the least action principle is an indispensable tool for model building beyond the standard model of particle physics and beyond general relativity. The action is usually easily obtained from first principles, either from the kinetic and potential energy or in field theories from underlying symmetries. Also modern approaches to quantum physics make use of the action. However, there the classical motion obtained from the least action principle is only the beginning of the story. In quantum physics all other trajectories also contribute to the final transition amplitude, but this is another story. 
This concludes my exposition to a very universal physical principle. If you are interested in a few more details, you are invited to continue watching the follow-up video. The main takeaway from this presentation should be that most of the processes that we can observe in nature are such that for given boundary conditions the motion will always take such a time dependence that the underlying action functional leads an optimized value. Whatever happens in nature, in some sense it will be optimal. Thanks for watching and don't forget to leave your ideas and recommendations in the comments.